brand's Libertine. Um, got the L's, put them backwards, and Libertine is, I suppose, freedom, want freedom of wings. So to fly a bike, wings, lightness, liberation, the liberation of a bicycle, which a lib the Libertines were. So from a philosophical point of view, to fly free, um, ride free. I, I started off with my first brand, the Simple Cycles. The first bikes were built under Simple. There was a BMX brand, Simple, and it just wanted to be about the simplicity of cycling to go off for a ride. But then after making a few bikes, there's nothing simple about making a bike. <laughs> Hello, welcome to Row TC. In this video, we're talking about custom hand-built bespoke shows. I'm joined by Phil Taylor, the organiser of the Bespoke UK hand-built show. Hi, Dave. Thank you for joining. Um, what was the catalyst for the bespoke show when it first launched in 2011? I suppose it started hand in hand with my getting into frame building. Um, I'd been sort of looking, making bikes for about a year. And in doing so, in sort of researching how I go about making bikes online, I was getting sort of drawn back to NABs and sort of the builders there. That was my kind of central focal point. Sort of looking in this country, why isn't there a bike show, a sort of handmade bike show in this country? So um, we decided to do it. So we rented a space in Bristol, contacted all the frame builders, which again, that, was, that wasn't easy. There wasn't a list of frame builders around. It was a case of searching, looking, um, Seaway, which is a frame building supply, had a little directory going through the, the, the classic sort of old school Roberts type people, but just yeah, trying to get a hold of people and see if they wanted to come to the show. Now, how healthy and vibrant was the handmade scene back then when you started launching the show? I think it was the beginning of a resurgence, I think. There was those that had stood the test of time and were still there doing it like say, Roberts and Roberts yeah, yeah um, and Rourke's there was still yeah, the old school was still there but there was a resurgence coming through of people like um, Ricky Feather Ted James Tom Don who they were just starting out it was their first real year of, of business and the show came and we, they came on board so it had this really good diverse mix of, of the old um, the old school, the Condor, people like that still, and the, the new young sort of guns of frame building who are sort of doing new and exciting things with it. Yeah. What do you put a resurgence down to? I think there was a, a bigger social movement of people, I suppose the, the hipster movement, although no one ever likes to be called a hipster, but that people taking a little bit more care of the provenance of their stuff, of where it's come from, how it's made, rather than just buying the mass-produced stuff, which I suppose killed, uh, sort of stopped a lot of frame building in the 70s and 80s, people were starting to think a little bit more about where their products came from in general, and cycling is part of that. A massive influx of new cyclists and people getting the bike-to-work scheme, I think that has a big impact on it, more people getting on bikes riding. And as they ride, they sort of, you start looking and thinking, Hang on, I want something a little bit different. Maybe I want to stand out. Um, what else is there? And I suppose that's where bespoke sort of handmade bikes fits in. People can get something made for them that's unique. And they're not getting a bike built necessarily to need a custom fit. It's more about having a bike that's unique and. Well, I think there's it. yeah. I think there's two different aspects to it. Um, there's when you think of getting a. a custom made bike, you think, uh, I, I, I traditionally go back to sort of tours, races, there's, um, when I used to cycle home past the swimming, from the swimming pool as a kid, we used to ride past the local frame builders, Bob Griffin, who's, I bumped into it not long ago, he was still working in Cheltenham, not as a frame builder anymore. Um, but yeah, touring bikes, um, having, getting it fit, made to measure to suit you, but they all, I suppose, traditionally offer you either have a race or a touring bike, and they're made to measure top tube, different length, so that all the contact points are in, in the right place. It's probably less scientific. There wasn't bike fitting back in the day. It was, you'd, you'd be measured, you'd have your inside leg measured, your arms measured, and that would be enough to get the fit approximate. But yeah, the, the fit element's a big part of it, but also yeah, people thinking, as I say, about the provenance. Where's my bike 
come from. And behind you, this is a, a regular frame building jig, isn't it? Yeah, this is a frame building jig. Um, and is that an off the shelf? Off the shelf, yeah. yeah. I, got, I got that from Shand Cycles. Okay, yes. Yeah. Scottish firm. Yes. Um, it's a quite an early frame building jig. It holds everything in the same place. So you put all the tubing on there when it's cut and it holds it in place so you can weld the bike together. Bottom bracket goes on there and every part of it moves. So it basically holds it, all the bits of the tube together in place so you can then, I, I tack it up in there and then weld it up just on a normal bike stand. Because okay. as you weld something, as you heat one bit, it moves. So you have to learn to keep it in phase of it moves it can move to two or three mil so you have to bend it one way then weld the other side to bend it back the other way so you have to do everything to keep it all square i guess there's a desire to get a frame tuned for your requirements say whether you're a big sprinter or a lighter climber yeah which a lot of mass manufacturer frames aren't made because they're made to appeal to a wide range of people on there yeah the mold yeah. and so on and still with the uh, preferred material choice for a lot of these um younger frame builders yeah and we say why you say steel is a preferred choice and there are arguably better materials um i think steel there's a heritage and i think especially yeah. from the builders getting into it <coughs> there's it's the easiest thing to build with in that you can go on a frame building course and use their expertise and their equipment and build a frame reynolds have hundreds of tubes in their catalogue so you can really tune it and, and I suppose it's that work better when you say there's better materials for it um, you have to I suppose define better is, is better faster is better longevity is better more sustainable you know what what is better if you want something that can be easily made easily repaired then steel is still maybe the best thing if a carbon frame breaks it can be repaired but at the end of its life it's a bit of plastic that yet can't be recycled so from a I suppose a sustainability steel can be fully recycled yeah. it can be mended it can be turned into it can be cut up and made into a kid's bike I've cut up frames and made them into kids bikes so it can be reused repurposed yeah, yeah. and you talk about heritage as well that that's probably I know it's a lot of younger frame builders that come into it. It's probably you know, we weren't around in the seventies when getting a custom made frame was the kind of default choice. Yeah. To go to bike shop, bike car, race bike. Yeah. Because the heritage probably is a big appeal to it. Kind of harking back to kind of the classic looking road bikes from the sixties, yeah, seventies, yeah. and eighties. Yeah, and there's there's events that sort of celebrate that, and there's I suppose people yeah. that go for a, a sort of like a heritage build with sort of down tube shifters. But then there's also a lot of bikes. I think Dan Craven, Saf um, Saffron Frameworks book, Dan Craven, a uh, bike that he rode the Commonwealth Games on, yeah. um, made of modern stainless steel. And the weight, there's not a lot of difference, I think. And not that these steel bikes are classic, kind of backward looking bikes, because one thing I noticed at one of the early shows is that they embrace uh, change in cycling, like disc brakes being. Mm. Remember, disc brakes are quite new in the industry, but these frame builders were embracing these disc brakes and wire tie clearance in a way that mass manufacturers free weren't. So yeah. they're, they're, they're smaller and more agile and able to kind of respond to the changes and what the customer yes. wants as well. Yeah, and I think they are forward looking, I thought. I yeah, think. yeah, very much so. I think it's it's that speed, the adaptability, mm. you can you're making one offs the whole time. So if there's a, a new sort of um, measurement coming in and a new what's it called, um, standard, yeah. or coming about, or fat bikes, fat bikes were, I suppose, at the handbill shows first, um, frame builders can just flex, sort of just, just change things very quickly, and adapt, and if a customer wants something, it can be built, and new standards can be tried out, see what customers have, and yeah, they'll, they'll always be, I suppose, pushing the boundaries at handmade shows, because that's where the new new fashions, new styles, new standards can be tested out quick and easy. Yeah. I suppose rather than bigger manufacturers, it takes them a long time to to gear up and get the bikes made. Yeah, and you come to this as a frame builder yourself, as well, so you have experience of what it's like to weld and put tubes together and, yes. and ride your own creation. Yeah, yeah, that's that, yeah, that's how I came into it, sort of from building a bike that I wanted that didn't exist at the time, um, and that yeah, hang on, I want something that. 
isn't quite there, isn't quite right, it's not on the shelves, I can't go and buy it, otherwise I probably would have done. Um, yeah, I wanted something a little bit different, and, and I think that helps with the show, knowing the, the difficulties and maybe knowing what customers want, knowing how, how long it takes to make a, a bike, um, and that they're all individual creations and the, the, the specialness of, of having a bike. And I noticed behind you there's a classic orange frame up there. I don't know if you can see that. What's the story of this one? So that was um, a bike. That was my second ever mountain bike. My first was a Muddy Fox mm -hmm. Courier, which got nicked. And then I had a paper round saved up, and my grandma gave me some money to buy that. And that was the best bike I've ever had. It arrived in a huge cardboard box with a carton of oranges. I just read um, A Clockwork Orange, the book by Anthony Burgess. Um, British, made in Halifax. That's but, a benchmark. Is that, did that set the seed then for your kind of passion for cycling? And It did, yeah. And, and that was the bike that I suppose I first had the White Industries Eno Hub to convert that to a single speed that I used to commute 15 miles a day on that. And it looks beat up and it looks as if like a... Yeah, good or clean. Item. But it's not. I, I only I took the bits off of it to put on the Hack Bike Derby bike. But I, looking at it like that, it does need to be... Um, Type of restoration. TLC, yeah. See, yeah, I cut the um, brake mounts off when it was, I, I, I rode it as fixed wheel, but then I welded them back on again. That was before I built a frame, I just got, I had just got my torch. So there's a lot of, uh, yeah, I love that bike. It, it, it takes time to build good frames. It takes time to build a brand and there's a, a whole array of skills you need to become a successful frame building company is different to building good frames. The, the listening to the customer, I think that's the key thing. Rather than building a bike you think the customer wants, to be able to really listen to the customer, and that's what takes the time to really find out, I suppose, what it is the customer wants to do with that bike, and how they're going to use it, and, and their, sort of their riding style. Bike fits, can take care of the, the geometry and the measurements, but it's knowing I suppose, from that, my personal point of view, is when a customer comes to pick up a bike, it's always a scary thought of, have I interpreted their idea as well as, as, well as they expect me to? Because you're, you're selling something that, you're sell that doesn't exist. And they can't test right before. No. They? So, no. it's not riding it, being yeah. right in. Yeah, that first ride off, it's, it's a petrifying moment. Like, yeah, I hope, <laughs> it, I hope it meets their expectations. Yeah. And yeah, it's... It's a nerve-wracking yeah. part of it. So when you start making bikes, you, you realise, oh, hang on, it's really hard to... Um, the, this is for getting the chain stays. So getting the chain stays, everything down there has to be square. So to get them cut and to be, like I was saying about the mitering, they have to be cut perfectly to the same length. So it's like, well, how can I do this? And you can put the, the dropouts on there weld the dropouts onto the end of the stays. I can put this, um, I can put both chain stays in there. I put this on the milling machine over here. And you get these special bike built cutters. So that's a bottom bracket shell that cuts straight down there in one cut in the milling machine. And that cuts you a perfectly fitting, perfectly, aligned chain stays so that when you weld it all up everything's going to stay completely square because you know that they're the same length that the bottom bracket has been cut just right so it's about but then at the time these things didn't exist when i was so you have to make your own tools so you're not make, only making your own frame but you're making your own tools to make the frames in the first yeah, place because then and then you know it's about constantly problem solving of like okay so i need something to be able to do that so if I make a tool that does that, I could, means I can replicate that every single time so I can get it just right. And yeah, that's part of the, the problem solving yeah. idea of making frames. So there's different levels of, uh, kind of custom bespoke frames you know, depending on what the customer wants and yes. how much you're prepared to spend the product. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah it's, it comes down to money. It's, not, yeah. it's never going to be a cheap thing because it takes someone a long time to make mm. a frame. And there's the, the time it takes to actually build the frame, but it's the that listening to the customer, that, that can take a lot of time. That's mm. that individual personalization of communication. There's a lot of emails usually nowadays, but 
that's what yeah, I urge people to sort of have a conversation, have a chat, and that's why I think Bespoke is good. It has that face-to-face -face meeting that when you buy a bike, you're buying a bit of the builder, so it's to get someone that you get on with that I suppose can, can interpret your idea into the bike of your dream. That's the unique thing about Bespoke, you meet the people actually responsible for building the frame, you yeah. see on the stand, rather than a big bike show, you might actually meet the marketing people, yeah. you don't actually meet the maker, you meet the people making the frame, don't you? Yeah. You have a relationship with them, and yeah. if you like them, go with them, you can... Yeah, and I think that's why we always get really good feedback that the show has an amazing atmosphere, and I think the idea is, the reason behind that is the people, the makers, get to come out and meet the public and, and sort of show off their creations. So a lot of the time people are working in workshops up and down the country or all over the world on their own in isolation and they have these, make these beautiful bikes, they wrap them up in um, plastic bubble wrap and send them off all over the world and they never really see that interaction. The customer might come along and present it, as I say, which is scary, but to stand behind something you've made and be able to talk about it and the visitors to the show can appreciate the effort and hard work that's gone into it, every bike that's been made. Yeah. It's just yeah, a conversation of people that love bikes. Yeah. You've been doing the spoke now for nine years, I believe? Yes, yeah, this will be the ninth show. Um, you've seen a lot of bikes in that time. What Are there, are there any standout bikes you've seen? Any kind of real examples of like the highest level of uh, workmanship in that nine years? That's a, t that's a tough question. It's, oh. it's, it's <laughs> ask me which one of my children yeah. is my favourite. Um, <laughs> not cause it's a, but just to, I suppose, um, Demon Frameworks, he was at the first show, he's been there um, throughout the show. His, the way he builds bikes is different to everyone else, I think, in the, the meticulous attention to detail, in that he, he makes a bike twice, he makes all of his own lugs. What I was saying about the, yeah. the Uncle Ben style, you can, you can buy a kit of lugs and put the tubes in and uh, braise them together. Um, but Tom makes his own lugs and carves his own lugs and makes all of his own dropouts. And the level of finish he gets is second to none. And I think um, Saffron Frameworks, again, that, that attention to detail, it's that final probably 5% that, that makes the bikes stand out. What can we expect from the, the show this year, then, the ninth edition of the show? Um, I think every year that is the standard just goes up and up and up and just that meticulous attention to detail the, the quality of the finish and uh, it's the, that that I think really stands out that the builders everyone there is brilliant at what they do and it's about that finding the person who builds the best bikes for you because yeah, as I say Matthew builds beautiful road bikes that's his I suppose speciality he can build other things um, Ted builds BMX it's an off road but Ted can build great road bikes but I suppose ask the, the builder what they ride and they'll, they'll have a passion for certain types of riding some people more adventure bike based um, yeah to sort of to ask the builder what they ride that's where they'll be thinking all the time how to make something a little bit neater whether it's just where the cable is running through the bike, you know, if I move that this way a little bit, it's something you probably wouldn't even notice, yeah. but you ask the builder what kind of bike they ride, and yeah, that's a good sense of, if, if that's, if you want the same kind of bike as the bike they ride, then they'll build you a good bike. Okay, yeah. So uh, when and where is Bespoke this year then, 2019? It's, it's um, May the 3rd, 4th and 5th, yep. and it's in Bristol at the Good Shed. Okay, there we go. That's the uh, Bespoke Show 2019. I recommend you go. It's one of the best shows in the country. If you want to check out some of the nicest hand-built bikes from the UK and around the world. Yes, from the, yeah, everyone in the world. America, Japan, yeah. um, Italy. The best of the best. Best of the best in okay. the world, yeah. Well, thank you, Phil, for your time. Uh, right, fascinating chat about Bespoke hand-built show, uh, bikes, sorry. Um, thanks for watching. If you've got any questions, put them in the comment section below. I'm sure we get Phil in there to answer some of them as well. Uh, but we'll see you again next time. Don't forget to like and subscribe as well. And yeah, we'll see you next time. Your your current ride, the mud this covered is, machine. I've got a few bikes. This is the one my go-to bike, especially living around where we live in the Cotswolds. These are my, I suppose, road tyres. They're covered in mud. I went out for a ride with my daughter. She was doing her cycling proficiency, so we went out for a little test ride. But everything's covered in mud around here. It's sort of farm machinery.
but yeah, that's my that's my cross bike. But I've got road wheels for it as well. So that's but yeah, my favourite bike. But the bike I'm riding at the moment is my favourite bike. Whichever bike I'm on, this summer I've just rode mountain bikes. But I like I like riding off road. But yeah, this was discs before discs were were popular and trendy. And to get the disc mounts in there, it's nine five three, which is the hardest material to work with. It's so so hard. I just kept breaking drill bits. I had to get special drill wow. bits to be able to cut it. And it's so thin here that you put a drill bit on. If it wasn't a really sharp drill bit, it would just bend the tubing because it wouldn't cut it. Fantastic, and a good set of tools, obviously. No workshop would be complete without lots of tools and files. Which could be tidier. Oh, tidier than mine. <laughs> <laughs>